Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Um, I thought I would do another book review as I've been really pushing myself to try and do more reading. So I've been reading a non-fiction book and this is Time Travel a History by James Gleek or Glick or Gleck. I don't know how to pronounce his name as usual. Um, I'm going to say Gleek. Um, so in the book um, Gleek talks about how the concept of time travel didn't really exist until the author H.G. Wells wrote his book The Time Machine in 1895. Although for thousands of years there had been foretelling and soothsayers trying to forecast the future, um, authors, writers had also described fantastical um, other places and uh, fantastical islands like um, Thomas More's Utopia which is um, just another island somewhere. And poets and philosophers had also um, referred to time in their um, poetry, uh, but no one had really talked about time travel and the concept of travelling through time. The time traveller in H.E. Wells' book um, rides into the future on his time travelling sled to the year 802701. I'm not actually sure how you pronounce that year. 802701? Uh, AD, um, uh, where he meets his companion Wiener, which is an interesting name, um, and the genre was kind of born. And then you move forward a little bit in time to 1889, and Mark Twain writes um, a Connecticut Yankee um, in Kanatha's Court, who is uh, a man who gets hit on the head and then wakes up, and he's actually travelled back in time to Camelot. And then moving forward even further in time, you have Woody Allen's Sleeper uh, in the 1970s, which is based on a book, uh, Rip Van Winkle, I believe, uh, about a man who essentially travels 200 years into the future, but this is through a long hibernation period. But can you really talk about travelling in time in the same way that you would talk about travelling in space? Is time the same thing as space? Um, what is time anyway? And these are the kind of questions that the book um, tries to answer, I suppose. Um, there is no introduction to the book, so it's not made explicitly clear what the purpose or what he was trying to get at when he wrote the book, um, but these are the kind of questions that do crop up in it. Judging by the um, blurb on the back of the book and just the description that's on there, when I picked this up I did actually think that this would be a lot more of a description of the way that time travel has been depicted in popular fiction, books, TV, films, etc. But there's actually a lot more science involved in the book. Um, and at times the science meets philosophy, um, which I suppose a discussion of time would really merit, that it's a... It's a commingling of scientific thoughts and concepts and then philosophy philosophical ideas, um, but that was a bit much for my brain at 8 o'clock in the morning on the way to work, and some of the science, I have to say, did go over my head <laughs> a little bit. For example, Newton needed the concept of absolute time for his theories and laws of motion to work. For example, motion is the measurement of a change in place over time, so I can kind of just get about get my head around that. But then it also gets a bit more complicated when you start talking about, um, for example, a couple of physicists, um, Richard Feynman and Johnny Wheeler, who went to visit Einstein because they had a paradox. And the paradox was that particles must exert their influence over other particles, not only um, forwards, but also backwards. So not only forwards in time, but also backwards in time, I guess. Um, so, for example, light is an interaction between different particles. This is what the book is telling me anyway. <laughs> I haven't done science in a very long time. When Feynman was actually picking up his Nobel Prize, um, he described um, when atoms shake in the sun, um, eight minutes later, atoms shake in your eye. Eight minutes is roughly the speed of light or the time it takes for the sun's light to get to you. Um, so that is the interaction of particles uh, for light. Um, but there has to be symmetry, so when it works forwards, it also works backwards. This is where I, it was too much, and I just, I didn't quite understand what he was telling me or why, and I did struggle with some of these science in the book, I have to be honest. I did find it quite interesting when he talks about the 
um, language we use around time and the metaphors that we use to describe time. So time passes and it flows, it's a river, it's a maze, um, it usually flows just in one direction, we think of that as being time's arrow, which is another phrase that is commonly used. It's also the name of Martin Amos' book, which I really enjoyed, and it's the name of a Star Trek episode, which I also quite like, uh, which is the reason that I also read the book called Time's Arrow, <laughs> because I liked the episode of Star Trek. Anyway, <laughs> Uh, apparently, though, in Mandarin uh, Chinese, the symbol for um, earlier is also the same as above, and then later is the same as below, and that's presumably because they write from top to bottom of a page rather than left to right. And apparently in Aboriginal communities, they have a much um, greater understanding of um, direction, uh, the natural world, direction, etc., and so they consider time moving from east to west rather than just left to right or in one direction. Um, so I found that really interesting. I'm much more interested in language and that and cultural um, stuff. Um, for me, I would have preferred a bit more of that, I think. Uh, when H.G. Wells wrote The Time Machine at the end of the 19th century, turn of the 20th century, um, there had been a lot of societal changes, as Gleek says, basically priming people, uh, scientists and philosophers, for changes in their understanding of time. So new technology, new ideas, um, steam trains, um, the electric telegraph, Darwin's theory of evolution, um, the perfection of clocks, if you want to understand time, it's quite good to have something that's an accurate way to measure time. Um, but society had changed and so people were ready to accept um, new ideas about, about time when he wrote his book about time travel. Um, so Greek goes on to say that our relationship with time though is continuing to change as our society has changed. So we now have a sense of permanent connectivity mainly because of of phones and that kind of technology. Um, we also have a blurring of the concept of past, present and future. Um, we have timelines, you know, on social media everything is in your timeline, but it doesn't necessarily um, go in chronological order. So the sequence that things are put in your timeline can be kind of arbitrary, so we're losing our understanding of um, sequential time. And to end with, um, Gleek argues that um, time travel is important to us only really because we want to elude death and time is only re really relevant to us because we die. But when you die, you continue to exist in the past and that is our form of immortality that is open to us. Which is kind of nice. It gives some comfort, I think. Um, Overall, I found this a really interesting book, but a bit too much for my brain, especially first thing in the morning. I kind of wish there had been a more of a clear introduction to the book, so I kind of understood more about what he was trying to get across, and I think that would have helped me when I was reading through it. Um, but I do think it was really interesting, and I do like non-fiction um, for that reason, because I do think it can be quite different and interesting, and this guy is clearly really, really smart, so um, I'm glad that he got... <laughs> He's getting his books published. <laughs> anyway, um, if you liked this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more videos, please subscribe. And if you have any ideas for books, please leave them in the comments below.